joining today's SDG Dialogue. By way of introduction, I'm Smita Nakuda. I work in the Strategy, Policy and Partnerships Department of ADB, where I coordinate our engagement on the Sustainable Development Goals. The SDGs provide a comprehensive framework of goals and targets that challenge all countries, organizations and investors to consider their impact on people and the planet. A growing range of tools, standards and initiatives to support investors to rise to this challenge have been developed in recent years. Multilateral development banks have been amongst the first investors to adopt such practices in their operations, given their core mandate of advancing sustainable development. But while we may have been front runners in the sustainable investment space, we need to continue to challenge ourselves to remain leaders. The ecosystem is increasingly diverse and is evolving quickly. Investors are signing on to voluntary principles that provide a common ethic that help them integrate impact. Impact management frameworks are emerging that help investors turn their ambitions to maximize positive impact or minimize negative impacts into practice. And tools that offer common metrics that allow investors to measure outputs and outcomes using standard definitions are also gaining pace. Disclosure and assurance have become integral parts of these efforts, and in many parts of the world, regulation is beginning to make sustainability reporting much more material to investors and businesses. Developing consistent, credible, and comparable impact measurement and management standards can play a vital role in mobilizing the financing needed to realize the SDGs. This has been a recurrent theme in other editions of the SDG dialogues that we've convened at ADB as we reflect on opportunities to step up our ambitions on this agenda. Today's discussion brings together leading experts to discuss the latest practices and impact management for the SDGs, including ADB's own efforts to align its operations with the global goals. Let me now turn to Ingrid Van Wies, our Vice President for Risk Management, for some opening reflections. Ingrid, thanks a lot for your time. Thank you, Shmita. Um, good day and warm greetings from Manila to all of you. It's a real pleasure to join this edition of Asian Development Bank's SDG Dialogues. Today's discussion will focus on impact measurement and alignment for the SDGs. The socioeconomic devastation caused by the COVID-19 pandemic has reminded us of a fundamental truth that sustainable development is elusive if economic growth is achieved at the expense of nature. For example, risks of spreading zoonotic diseases are increased by human encroachment on nature. Zoonotic diseases can trigger health crises, which in turn can translate in human and financial crises. Therefore, we need a much broader and more sophisticated approach to defining and managing integrated sustainable development risks. In the past two years, there has been a tremendous surge in investment seeking environmental and social returns alongside financial gains. Estimates suggest that the global sustainable finance market is now worth more than 35 trillion US dollars. Regulators are taking a growing interest in these issues. SDG aligned impact measurement can play a crucial role in sustaining these trends and ensuring they are meaningful. ADB aims to deliver sustainable development in Asia and the Pacific. We ensure the sustainability of projects and programs we finance through stringent feasibility criteria, assessment of economic viability, and risk mitigation measures. Our environmental and social safeguards seek to ensure that projects do no harm. Through a range of measures, including technical assistance for project preparation, ADB works with borrowing member countries to enhance the bankability of projects. Under ADB Strategy 2030, ADB's operations focus on assisting countries achieving their SDGs and the Paris Agreement on Climate Change. The associated Corporate Results Framework assesses ADB's operational and organizational performance in achieving this strategy. We have put the SDGs at the heart of our approach to manage for results and effectiveness, and ADB is the first multilateral development bank that systematically links its projects to the SDGs. Our country partnership strategy results frameworks are now grounded deeply in national priorities related to the global goals. We continuously strengthen and refine these systems and champion a common approach amongst MDBs. In 2020, for example, 
ADB co-led the first joint report on contributions to the SDGs, published under the guidance of the heads of 11 NDBs and the IMF. In conclusion, ADB has set a range of targets to scale up financing and steer capital towards the SDGs. Yet, there is much more to be done. In a fast changing finance environment, where our goals as development banks are shared with a growing number of public and private investors, we need to ensure our practices are in line with the new standards and approaches. Today, we are honored to be joined by a distinguished group of partners from the Impact Management Project, UNDP and ACTUS, to reflect on the opportunities to raise the bar further in this very dynamic field. I thank you for your time and participation, and I look forward to a very good discussion. With this, back to you, Smita. Thanks so much, Ingrid, um, for those opening reflections. And let us now turn to the panel for their views on this fast evolving space. So perhaps I could start with Olivia Prentice, who's the Chief Operating Officer of the Impact Management Project. Olivia, the Impact Management Project established itself as a vital forum for building consensus on how to measure, assess, and report impacts on people and the environment. Can you reflect a little bit on how this space has matured over the past few years and the key opportunities and challenges that you see ahead? Thank you so much and good morning or good afternoon to everybody. Um, yes, I'm speaking to you at quite a weird time for the Impact Management Project because we are a time-bound initiative which has effectively come to the end of its six-year life this month. Um, for those of you that don't know, as Shmita said, the Impact Management Project has been a forum for trying to build consensus around social and environmental impact management. When we launched, there was a huge proliferation of language and approaches by different communities and initiatives to try and get clarity on this topic were not exactly new, but what we specifically tried to do was bring together different communities. I have an impact investing background and so what I noticed was the impact investors were using different tools and approaches and frameworks to ethical or responsible investors or development finance institutions who in turn critically used different metrics and language to the corporates or nonprofits that they were providing capital to. And that was causing a um, difficulty up and down the investment value chain, a lack of understanding, a lack of coherence, and fundamentally a lack of ability to flow capital to where it was needed and to solve um, social environmental problems and contribute to the SDGs. So the IMP facilitated market participants and then the standard setters themselves to really establish whether if all actors considering their impacts ultimately looking, are ultimately looking at change experienced by people and planet, we can actually get to one, one accounting system, one approach to measuring impacts across all groups that provides the information needed for all stakeholders, be that governments, corporates, NGOs, asset owners, to make impact management decisions, to improve their impacts on people and the natural environment. And so over the five last five years, we've seen tremendous progress, and I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing the reflections of my fellow panelists today, but there have just been a few developments that I'd highlight as critical. There has been increased recognition that consideration of ESG factors does first require measurement of an organization's impacts in order to figure out whether those impacts affect the value, create or erode value of the organization um, and therefore create or erode value for its investors. This has been a big moment and it's really just been down to language because it's enabled ESG and impact standard setters for the first time to really come together and work together towards market clarity. And in many ways has led to some of the big announcements around corporate disclosure that we heard in, in the last couple of months. And the other brilliant development we've seen is incredible leadership by standard setters who have come together, 16 or 17 of them, to work on a shared narrative, which is found on what will be the IMP's successor. Um, it's called the Impact Management Platform. I would really encourage you all to please look at the site if you haven't seen it already. I can share the link in the chat. The site illustrates that many core concepts are actually common to all organizations, regardless of your impact goals or risk return profiles. And it explains how different standards can be used together in a complementary way 
to create a whole system of different standards, um, which I think we'll touch upon later. And so to the final part of your question, what's the opportunity now? It really is adoption. We have the tools, we have you know, real practitioner leadership, but we need that transparency and we need that real push because of course the big challenge we now face is we need to all do this quickly if we're gonna achieve that, that 2030 goal. Thank you. Thanks so much, Olivia, um, for sharing that reflection on the evolution of the of the impact management project experience and the and this new position that the world now finds it in in terms of uptake and and, and opportunities for consolidation. Um, let me turn now to Fabienne, um, who leads the SDG Impact Initiative at UNDP. Um, UNDP has long been known to many of us in the public sector as a champion for integration of the SDGs into national policy, um, but it's also stepped into an important role in trying to define new internal management standards for SDG-aligned business and investment. Um, the UNDP has also partnered with the OECD to develop the impact standards for financing sustainable development. Could you tell us a little bit about these efforts and how organizations are making use of these standards in practical terms? Thanks, Smita, and thanks, and thanks for having me. It's lovely to be here this evening. So um, SDG Impact uh, is a flagship initiative of the UNDP housed in the finance sector hub, um, and it was established about two and a half years ago, and really, you know, recognising that need to mobilise private capital towards achievement of the SDGs. As, as you noted, um, UNDP has a long history on the development side, but, um, but one of the key barriers to achieving those outcomes is... Um, is the flow of capital to those um, to SDG um, solutions. So, um, so SDG Impact was really um, set up to try and uh, accelerate the mobilisation of private capital towards the SDGs, and uh, particularly around the standards that work um, uh, also came out of our involvement with the IMP structured network and the identification of, of a gap um, in so much as there was a lot of work going into um, high level principles, such as the operating principles for impact management, um, work of, um, you know, work of the UNPRI, UNGC, et cetera, around high level principles, a lot of uh, activity and work around um, the development of tools and, and resources and also um, uh, a lot of focus on the external reporting but, but less focus on the internal management framework um, to actually um, enable um, decision making um, to, uh, to achieve the SDGs and particularly with a focus to integrating the, the um, sustainability and SDGs into decision making. So SDG Impact was really set up to help businesses and investors um, put sustainability at the core of their um, their management decisions and um, drive capital to where it can have the most most impact. Um, the uh, the standards um, the standards are uh, we have four sets of standards. So as you mentioned, um, the, set, the set that we've developed in partnership with the OECD that's targeted at um, uh, donors and their private sector partners, uh, as well as as um, uh, three sets of SDG impact standards for enterprises, bond issuers, and private equity funds. And we really see those as um, a family of a, a family of standards that um, uh, tailored to different user groups, but very much fundamentally the same in their structure. So. Um, um, uh, and and the way they're set up. So um, in our view, they create that shared language um, and approach for integrating impact management and the SDGs into decision making. And that in doing that helps to connect actors across the system to come together to um, work towards um, collective solutions. You know, I think particularly where there's, uh, uh, you know, the pointier end of SDG need, um, that's, uh, that's often a result of market failure. It's not going to be solved by pure market solutions. So we need capital across the spectrum to come together and be able to communicate and work together towards those solutions. The other thing the standards tried to do was really um, fill gaps in current market practices that we think are undermining progress towards the sustainable development goals. And, you know, very much the focus on strategy and, and governance were, you know, gaps that we saw in, in the existing frameworks, uh, as well as really focusing on, um, you know, setting ambitious targets and linking that to, to thresholds as set out in frameworks like the sustainable development goals. So um, as well as the as well as the standards, we're building an assurance framework around the standards. Uh, and that will um, uh, we should be piloting that early in 2022. The standards we really developed to be best practice and provide that North Star in terms of what we think 
organisations and investors need to move to to be able to um, really um, uh, adopt practices that are consistent with achieving the sustainable development goals. Um, but at the same time, recognising that, um, that we're not there yet, the assurance um, framework will set minimum uh, thresholds with a requirement to demonstrate continuous improvement over time. So, um, so we're looking forward to piloting that with um, potential users and assurers next year. Um, the uh, the um, other part of your question just around uh, how practically organisations are engaging with the standards. Um, uh, at this stage, what we're seeing is organisations really, um, you know, starting to familiarise themselves with the standards, using some of the tools like the self-assessment guide to, um, to uh, perform a gap analysis and see how, you know, how they're currently placed relative to the standards, um, uh, having their staff undertake the um, free online um, uh, training course on impact measurement and management for the SDGs that we developed in partnership with Duke University, which went live in um, in September and uh, has already has uh, over 4,000 um, people signed up um, and enrolled in the course. Um, uh, joining some of the, the working groups and um, pilots that we've had uh, running um, and also incorporating the standards, particularly for PE funds, into the design of new funds, um, new impact funds that are coming to market. So we've seen advisors actually using the standards to integrate it into how they provide advice to their clients, such as um, private equity funds. Uh, another example was um, RNI, the, the um, rating agency in Japan, used the standards to integrate it into a review and assessment of the city of Kobe's um, uh, SDG strategy. Uh, NDB in China has is piloting the standards as well as the China taxonomy on uh, SDG bond issue they did in March, and we'll be working with them as they start to report out on, on self-assessment uh, against the standards as we wait for the assurance framework to come into place. Um, we're working with the OECD along with the, um, the, uh, the SDG joint fund um, to pilot uh, all of the standards within that framework. So the OECD, UNDP standards at the fund level, um, and then the SDG impact standards at the underlying uh, investment level. So lots of different ways that people are starting to engage with the standards and, and pick them up in, in what they're doing. Fantastic, Fabian. Thanks so much for sharing that perspective on how these standards are being taken up and the, and the particular niche that they're occupying in a space that does, as, as others have noted, have multiple dimensions and multiple players in it. Um, let me now turn for an investor perspective to Shami Nissan, who's the head of sustainability at Actis, one of the world's larger sustainable infrastructure investors. Um, and Actis has really championed the sustainability agenda and put in place a range of tools to maximize the impact of its investments. Um, you were one of the first signatories to the operating principles for impact management, which were created in 2019 by the International Finance Corporation as a tool for investor impact focused investors, and you serve on the advisory board for the principles as well. I was hoping you could give us a bit of an investor perspective on this evolving space and how you see these various standards creating different incentives for a greater focus on impact for the SDGs. Thank you, Smita, and thank you for having me. Um, and hello, everyone, wherever you are in the world. Um, yes, we joined um, the um, IFC Operating Principles for Impact Management as one of the first adopters, and I'm lucky enough now to be on the advisory board of that. So my comments will come with that context and through that lens. Um, but in addition, um, I was recently asked to join the board of something called the G7 Impact Task Force as well, um, which was created earlier this year, which is a sort of high level um, working group focused on um, how to basically um, scale and mobilize more capital into impact investing. And the particular thematic focus, if you like, of the work is very much the transition, the energy transition, and in particular, um, the so-called just transition, which I want to come to in a little while. Um, but as you said, Actis, uh, very focused on sustainable infrastructure from day one. It's part of our investment ethos. Um, and we want to provide solutions to global sustainability challenges. So without ever in the past really having used the terminology or the lexicon of impact, in many ways, many of our funds through our investments were delivering um, 
considerable environmental and social impact. And that's why um, a few years ago, 2018, we started to really think about, well, how can we better convey this and explain it in a evidence-based rigorous way um, to our investors who are asking about this more and more. Um, and that really was the, the trigger for us to develop our own um, impact measurement system, which we call the Actus Impact Score, AIS. And it's a policy that we applied across every single investment that we do. So it wasn't specific to a particular impact fund or corner of what Actus invests in. It was every transaction, every geography, every strategy. Um, and I think that's really important. I'll come back to that in, in, a, in a second. But um, yeah, so the AIS is basically about measuring um, you know, your impact on day one and measuring your impact at exit and understanding how have you increased that during the time um, that you have been a responsible and active owner of that asset or company. Um, it also gives us an ability to compare um, impact between different uh, investments. So we might be investing in a renewable company um, in India um, or a data center in Africa. So what is the difference? So it gives us an ability to compare kind of apples to apples. And, and you know, what I want to do here is also just give massive um, kind of thanks to Olivia and Impact Management Project, who were really, really helpful in helping us frame our thinking, um, because the IMP has something that is called the fundamentals of impact. And that really gave us a skeleton, if you like, like a structure to, to approach this in a way that was going to build kind of consensus with the industry and give some credibility um, that we weren't manufacturing something entirely of our, you know, in a vacuum on our own. So we use the IMP's fundamentals of impact as a frame as a framework, but we absolutely aligned all our thinking and approach with the SDGs as well. You know, and back to the kind of the wider conversation we're having here, Smith. So that is the Venn diagram of impact investing and SDGs. These two things come together highly synergistically. So I, I think that, you know, coming to the second part of your question, um, the rise of impact investing or sustainable investing, Ingrid mentioned 35 trillion. There are some much larger numbers than that. Um, if you just look at Mark Carney's announcement at COP26 purely on net zero, that's in the range of 100 and, 130 trillion. So, you know, the amount of capital going in the direction of impact slash sustainability is huge and growing. So there is an incredibly important role for the SDGs as a framework to guide that capital. And, and in particular, because some funds or investors who are focusing exclusively on impact might have a bit of a singular lens, like a single sector, a single impact outcome, or a single theme. Even something like the energy transition, which is absolutely critical for us to arrive at a net zero global future. Um, it's really important to think about the transition as not just the E of ESG. It's not just about carbon. You can decarbonize, sure, but what are the other in, unintended consequences that you might be having through your investments in renewables, for example? There are many um, kind of complexities there. It's nuanced. Uh, and how does it impact society, indigenous people, land rights? And that's before you've thought about natural capital and biodiversity. So what I really appreciate hugely about the SDGs is it forces us to think holistically about sustainability in the round, rather than just down a single narrow lens of a one impact. Um, you know, and uh, I think that's why I mentioned earlier the phrase just transition. I much prefer to talk about that than just the transition where you can get hyper-focused on carbon. The SDGs remind us all of these goals, 17 goals are intersectional and interdependent. Um, and, and I think that's hugely, hugely valuable. And, and that's kind of, you know, to answer your question, how, how are we creating incentives to focus on SDGs? I think directing impact investors to the SDGs gives them that or, or triggers them to think um, more holistically. And if you get this right, you know, there's a great prize, which is not just competitive returns, outsized impact. Um, there's also what we touched on very briefly earlier, you know, green finance. You can use these measurement tools, you can use impact, you can use the SDGs now 
to, to um, you know, get preferential rates, to get sustainability linked loan, green finance tools, green bonds, all of these um, more innovative kind of mechanisms now are going to start to really, I think, take off and they need to be grounded in something solid and rigorous um, SDGs and impact measurement frameworks are going to provide, and we're already seeing this happen for us in our portfolio, are going to provide um, the framework against which such financial mechanisms can, can function. I'll stop there. <laughs> Fantastic, Shami, and thanks for reminding us that, you know, the, the strength and challenge of the SDG framework is its holistic integrated nature, and sometimes that can be daunting, but actually as we move forward um, on this agenda with greater seriousness, that is proving to be increasingly its strength, um, that it provides us a way to look at interlinkages, as you, as you noted. Um, so if I could turn next to Craig Roberts, who's an advisor in our private sector operations department. Um, Craig, as you well know, we've had a longstanding focus on results in our financing at ADB, um, and the private sector operations department, which leads our private sector investment efforts, has really been working to deepen its focus on results, impact, and development effectiveness over the last few years. I was hoping you could tell us a little bit about some of these efforts and, and your reflections on the opportunities for ADB to deliver on its mandate of helping countries mobilize financing for the SDGs. Okay, th thanks, Mita. Um, as you say, it's uh, a long history and it's in our DNA as a development bank, as an investor to align uh, with the SDGs, but before that, the MDGs, um, and before that, the, the Rio Summit of 1992. So there's a long history of aligning our business in terms of where we invest and what we invest in. So it very much informs the sector profile of, of what we do. But a couple of years ago, given the, the focus on this area, you know, we started to have a think, well, how do we take that to the next step? So we've always been tracking our development results and building reporting mechanisms into transactions. But we really started thinking about strengthening the alignment, alignment and trying to enhance how we choose the projects that we undertake um, and how we assess them as part of our decision making. As any private in, in investor uh, will be, it'll be very focused on credit risks and, and making sure the commercial aspects of the transaction works. But we wanted to take our thinking, like much of the market, a little bit further to say, well, how do we really incorporate the impact and the risk to the impact into our, into our decision making? So the last year or two, we've been building a, a framework that we're currently piloting um, to look, uh, as Shami was saying, at every transaction that, that we do. And that, and that tool um, is a framework that looks at all aspects of a transaction. It looks at what we think the business success or the business outcome would be. It looks at the economic performance. What, what benefits does it deliver um, to our developing member countries? We look at environmental, social, um, and health safeguards. Uh, how do we think it's going to do? How compliant will it be with policy? We look importantly at the contribution that it can make to sector and market development. And here is a, uh, it, that's one of those points where it really comes to the theory of change. Looking at a DMC, identifying the challenges or, or the gaps and looking at how, at, at how our transactions can actually help fill those, those gaps. So there's a very, very direct linkage to both our own strategy, which then directly links back to the, to the SDGs. Um, we factor in as well risk. So we try and make an assessment of the risk to development results, which, which very often is aligned to the traditional risk analysis that you would do around a, a, a transaction, but takes it a few steps further. So that when we're looking at a transaction that we can then get a holistic picture of, well, what impact do we think that will have? What are the risks that it may not have that impact if certain things happen? And then can you build in some mitigation into the structure of the transaction that you're, that, that, that you're doing? That's powerful in itself. And then I firmly believe, um, as Olivia was saying, you've got, you've got to be able to measure these things. You've got to be able to measure impact, track impact, 
the intentions you had, are those being delivered? Powerful in itself, but I think the real power for a development bank is incorporating that into a portfolio approach. And what do I mean by that? I mean, basically plotting any one transaction against all of the other transactions you're potentially looking to originate, but also against your portfolio. So it's very much real time. It's very much giving you a picture of what your portfolio is doing and what, if necessary, any strategic or tactical changes you need to make to your origination strategy as you, as you go forward. Because risk is part of the game here, and there will be transactions that, that don't do so well and don't deliver on the impact. So you've got to be able to I identify those and manage them and, and, and uh, try and put corrective action plans in place. But you can also adjust them at the, the front end in terms of your origination strategy. I'll hand back to you, Smita. Thank you. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Craig, for, for framing that so well in terms of the approach that we're trying to take and, and deepen um, at ADB. Um, I want to turn now to our audience for a few of their reflections on what has our speakers have made clear is a very dynamic um, and impo increasingly important space. Um, so in your view, when it, you should see a polling question pop up in front of you, and there'll be multiple choices that show up on Zoom in, in just a second. In your view, when it comes to impact management for the SDGs, do you think that understanding of impact measurement and alignment approaches remains nascent? The uptake of standards remains limited. Multiple standards have now emerged and there's a need for more convergence and harmonization. Or D, and perhaps this is a bit of a cheat, all of the above. <laughs> oh, so I was quite sure that the answer would unanimously be D, all of the above. Um, but interestingly, um, we see a bit more heterogeneity in our audience perspectives on, on this. Um, and also, you know, equally strong view that actually multiple standards now need to look at ways in which they can converge and work more effectively as a coherent and consistent ecosystem, um, possibly a simpler ecosystem. Um, so with those reactions from our audience on the state of play in mind, and let me now turn to our panelists for a second set of, of reflections on particularly this question of how we deepen um, uptake, standardization, and harmonization around uh, impact standards with the focus on the SDGs. So maybe we could start with Fabienne of UNDP again. Um, Fabienne, could you reflect a little more on this particular niche that the UNDP SDG impact standards occupy in the landscape of SDG-aligned impact measurement and alignment standards? What do you see as some of the key issues that we need to resolve if we are to have greater harmonization and consolidation of the of the ecosystem? Thanks, Mira. Uh, um, uh, it's it's interesting. I think that I, I think our view in terms of or what we've attempted to do with the SDG impact standards is actually um, uh, create a decision making framework that helps to make sense of a lot of the other things that are in the ecosystem and that will continue to, to develop and we would want them to develop because you know there's still so much more that we need to do and, and room for improvement in so many ways um, so you know so the standards um, you know at their heart um, integrate the SDGs um, uh, and the IMP um, you know five mentions of impact and ABCs and, and that's really the core of the language that's embedded in, in the standards across all of the sets of standards that have been have been developed. So, um, uh, you know, as I said before, you know, then it, it also helps to connect the other things. And I think provide the context to enable users to um, thoughtfully select, um, you know, the frameworks and tools that make sense for the particular context that they're operating in. And I think that's really important because um, uh, I'm, I'm probably uh, a little bit of an outlier on comparability um, to, to some people. I think that I think that decision useful information is um, a higher order um, uh, higher order priority than than comparability per se. Even when we look at financial um, accounting and statutory reporting, there's a lot of variation. Um, and sometimes I, I see in the sustainability space people really trying to slavishly push for you know that what I call the magic magic metrics that everyone can use and make things simple. But, you know, sustainability and sustainable development is not simple. It's, it's quite complex and it's quite context specific. So, you know, in terms of commonality of approaches, you know, I think what we really need is, is um, to move towards uh, a common understanding of sustainability 
why it's important in a business and investment context and recognise that we're at a bit of a crossroads where the, um, you know, where the tenets of our financial and economic system that we've been relying on uh, up till now aren't future fit and we're going to need to shift our thinking and our mindsets around um, uh, the role of sustainability and shift from it being an add-on to what business gets done to being the lens through which all business and investment gets done. And also recognising, and I think Olivia made this point in her opening comments, that um, to understand how uh, impacts impact uh, enterprise value or financial um, performance of investments and um, and companies, we really need to understand all impacts, um, immaterial impacts that, that organisations and investments are having. And what may be considered financially material today or not financially material today may change in the future. And because we've got really you know, significant long-term trends that mean that that's shifting, um, that understanding uh, you know, impacts from an impact perspective, not starting from a perspective of financial materiality is really, really important. So, um, you know, really when I look at the standards, what we've tried to do is, is create that um, space to start start agitating for that change in mindset. So moving the thinking from SDG alignment to SDG action, instead of using the SDGs as another um, uh, filter to report what we're already doing differently, use the SDGs strategically to make different decisions, to look at, you know, to reconsider business models and think about how we partner with different actors in the system that we haven't before to play a different role in terms of creating solutions. And rather than thinking of it in our silo and what we can do alone, um, how can we partner with those different actors and use those different pools of capital to actually um, be part of creating the solutions that we that we need to create. Um, the, you know, the, the other aspect um, also for, for us is obviously measurement is a really important part of, of, uh, of impact management. But at the moment, um, oftentimes the measurement is, is almost seems to be um, for the purpose of reporting out rather than for using it internally to make different decisions and um, really measuring and thinking about what information we need to inform decision making and you know how do we actually um, you know how do we use that information to create options how do we make trade-offs how do we decide from an efficiency and effectiveness perspective the, the right level of information I think you know um, uh, uh, Clara or, or Olivia you know often use the term um, enough precision for the decision not every decision that we make needs a lot of information and, um, uh, and you know, um, evidence-based um, thinking behind it, especially if it's not going to change the decision. What we need to do is focus our attention on what's material and where there's material risks that the outcomes as experienced by people and planet are going to be different from what we expected. And if we can really sort of start, you know, thinking about it from that perspective and then using things like, you know, the SDGs and, you um, uh, that common understanding of why it's important and what it means, then there should be room for variability of the tools and, and how people go about that because it's going to be context specific and different actors and organisations are going to have different ways to achieve that. So, you know, I, I guess, you know, my ways of thinking that bounded flexibility approach where you have a strong principles-based framework and you enable and facilitate good decision-making within that, that framework. Thanks so much, Fabian. And I think this point you've made about the importance of decision materiality versus comparability is a really important one for us to us to bear in mind because there is this temptation to think that you know less is always always more and a more streamlined universe of tools is necessarily always going to be better. But this is a diverse landscape that that we're working in, and and, and tools need to be fit for a purpose and and dynamic as well as as needs yeah. change. Yeah, yeah, and it's um, interesting because you know my background was actually um, uh, you know credit and. I spent most of my career at S&P Global and, um, you know, obviously ratings are, you know, a globally comparable tool, but behind, but underneath that, um, there's, uh, you can't actually apply the same approach in different market contexts and different market structures um, and get a comparable outcome. You actually need to be context specific, you know, under, right. under the line to actually achieve that comparability at the higher level. And that's where I think tools like, um, uh, you know, the IMP framework help there because, you know, you can have that flexibility underneath 
uh, in terms of, you know, making that decision making and it rolls up into, you know, um, uh, an understanding of, of the type of impact that's being being created. So. Great. Let me now turn to Shami um, for your views on where you see the scope for a greater focus on impact to align uh, to, to drive more capital towards sustainable development, particularly in our in our region. Where do you see opportunities to strengthen approaches? Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I just want to endorse, you know, some of the themes that um, Fabian touched on. I, I really think that we are as investors kind of at a really, really key inflection point. Um, COP26, COVID um, have contributed, I think, to a really unprecedented level of um, discussion, attention to um, sustainability and impact. In the EU context, the, there's something coming in on a regulatory um, level called SFDR, Sustainable Finance Disclosure Regulation, and we have something called the Green Taxonomy. So there's all of these kind of different forces that are making it virtually impossible for any prudent, forward-thinking investor to ignore the clamor on kind of sustainability and impact. So I think we are moving towards, towards, not there at all yet, this kind of, Fabian, what you were talking about, which is really just infusing sustainability into everything that you do and how you think, and crucially into your investment decision-making process, you know, and that therefore is, is, you know, there's not then one trigger that we need to activate capital to go into sustainability. It means that everyone investing will think about sustainability. And I really like that because it's universal and democratic and how it should be. It also takes people away from this thing where they perhaps feel they have to be more purist. I have to invest in renewables or sustainable ag or affordable housing or healthcare, whatever, whatever, which feel inherently impactful and of course are critically important. But if we're going to achieve the SDGs, if we're going to achieve the transition, we have to think of it as a whole economy transition. Every sector, every investment needs to decarbonize, become more sustainable, more impactful, et cetera, et cetera. So it doesn't matter what you're doing, you know, what your sector strategy is. You need to think about sustainability because know this, every investment has an impact. So the question is, do you want to know what yours is or not? And of course, it's not acceptable, you know, when your asset owner client asks you, you know, where's, where are my dollars going? Um, how impactful are they? Is it net negative, net positive? You can't say, I don't know. Um, so, you know, everyone has to now engage, I guess is what I'm saying. And that will um, hugely help to drive more impact in, in the region. Um, I think, of course, the other opportunities that we need to deliver on is um, measurement, transparency, disclosure. We need to, of course, get that right. We need the clients, the asset owners to push for this because those who are more recalcitrant need that kind of while the client asking for it. So I have to do it. Um, others are more at the vanguard and moving forward on their own. So we need some of these forces to move in tandem to really unlock the maximum. But, but I think we're on the way. Um, and probably the last kind of few things I wanted to say on this is you know, we have these huge megatrends, two massive megatrends uh, today, um, the energy transition, climate change, and we have digitalization. So, you know, for us, when we think about our mission, sustainable infrastructure for a better tomorrow, we're very interested and excited by the huge opportunity of kind of digital infrastructure, which we think of almost as the fourth global utility. And it is a hugely impactful sector no bones about it in terms of the links to GDP, economic growth, um, inclusion um, in society. And then of course the transition. And in Asia, both of those um, areas are very, very relevant to, to the Asian markets um, and society. So I think there will be more capital flowing to chase those trends. If we can over, you know, infuse the sustainability and impact in there, that would be fantastic. I think there is an interesting part within the transition piece for Asia around fossil fuels, um, around gas, around the need for power, population growth in some markets, and how we move 
but I think a pragmatic approach is needed here, not a purist one. It is a transition. The key role of any investor is to be doing that transitioning during their time as an owner, rather than just saying, we're gonna corral all our dollars and put them just into these very safe, impactful sectors. That won't actually get us to solving the SDG problems or, or avoiding you know, runaway climate change. So I think pragmatism is, is what needs to rule it with regards to that. And Shani, your, your so comment on, on digital um, links back to your other thing on the um, on um, the holistic nature, because obviously the digital transformation has as many potential negative impacts on inclusion as it does um, positive, positive, which needs to be taken into account. Yeah, yeah, I agree. <laughs> So on this tone of pragmatism, um, let me turn to Olivia, um, because the impact management project has had to be very pragmatic and take on some of these things that we talk about in broad terms around, you know, trying to have more common standards and come up with common languages and actually get it done um, and actually do the hard work of, of, of getting different players to come to the, the same table and, and consolidate existing standards. I was wondering if you could reflect on some of the lessons learned from that experience um, and where you see the key opportunities or needs ahead. Thank you. And I just want to say how much I enjoy that call to action, Shami. Um, and I'm now going to give a slightly different perspective. As you say, we've been doing quite unusual work behind the scenes as the IMP. Um, not necessarily as thrilling, but I think it's a it's a nice point in the at the end of this project to kind of share a few of those lessons. Um, firstly, I just wanted to pick up on what, what Fab described there, just to really echo that point because it's such a key lesson and something that I think practitioners really need to understand better, which is that there are there are many different actions of impact management. And for more about those actions, actually, do go to the impactmanagementplatform.org website. But um, each action requires slightly different standards. So it's not that there's going to be this one standard that, that fits all, as Fab was saying, but there, there are the UNDP standards and principles for impact management practice and assurance of those practices which of course is distinct from other impact management actions like disclosure, impact evaluation and benchmarking. And they require other standards, be that capitals coalition, impact weighted accounts for valuation or well benchmarking alliance or B-Lab for benchmarking. And so we need two things. We need consolidation of standards within actions. So sometimes there are too many options for one metric for carbon. Bizarrely, we still haven't got to that one metric. And so, you know, we need consolidation there. This isn't alignment. This is consolidation. There needs to be one way of understanding things. If scientists have said this is the right way of measuring it, sometimes there'll be less specificity. But certainly with a lot of the climate um, topics, we can have consolidation there and enable that comparability. And then we need connectivity between the actions. So for example, um, a lot of the work that we've been doing over the last few months has been facilitating the creation of the ISSB, the International Sustainability Standards Board as part of the IFRS. And that has enabled the consolidation of what was previously SASB and the IRC, which is now the Value Reporting Foundation, further consolidation of that organization into the ISSB with CDSB. If all of that was a lot of uh, acronyms, do, do, I do encourage you to look up those ISSB standards. There are actually prototypes already on the website and they are gonna be coming into force um, very soon next year after that public consultation. Do encourage everyone to get involved in that consultation. But that's a great example of consolidation within one action, the action of disclosure. Um, and of course that will then affect the other actions that come after disclosure like benchmarking. And so already there's been a lot of work by those organizations to make sure that their benchmarks are driven by those standards. And that will obviously in turn be great news for some of those black box metrics and, and ratings that Fab touched on, which, um, you know, traditionally it's not really clear which, which metrics and which data they've been driven by. But hopefully now with a little bit more transparency on disclosure, we can get that. So, yeah, my first lesson is, you know, there are many many different actions of impact management and we need different standards for different ones. And, and that's okay. It's a little bit like financial management, financial accounting. There are just different processes which require different tools. And then I guess secondly, slightly more effectively, you know, we've learned the importance of really seeing organizations pull together towards a shared goal and continually considering, which is the harder bit, what's in the best interest of the market in terms of maximum comprehension and ultimately adoption. 
there are so many incredible organizations out there, but it's actually a perverse feeling to then say, well, actually, you know, maybe success for us as a nonprofit, a voluntary standard setter is declaring success and consolidating with another organization rather than competing for market share of something that is similar, but slightly different. And that's been quite a, a hard lesson, I think, for us as an industry to learn, but there's been some incredible leadership. And I guess then finally, my lesson has been, you know, how can we go further? Um, the IMP is ending because we, we plan to, and we want to show that actually nonprofits can get to a point where we can say, look, we've, we've achieved what we've tried to do. The, the IMP norms that Fab mentioned have been taken on by standards like the UNDP ones, and they're on the platform website. Um, but there's also a limit to what a neutral facilitator can do in terms of convergence. And here is, I guess, to add on to Shami's call of action, you know, practitioners not only need to be pragmatic, they not only need to make sure that they're thinking about the impact of their investments, but they also need to be asking questions of the standard setters that they use and, and really drive that convergence story further. And hopefully through there being greater transparency on this site about how the standards fit together within actions and between actions of impact management, we can get to a point where we can point to things as practitioners and say, look, why, how do I use that with that? Or, you know, and sometimes the answer will be, you don't need to, you know, that that, that covers that action sufficiently. But unfortunately, it's, it's still the case where it's not quite clear how things fit and they need to, because we need to speed up adoption and understanding. And at the moment, some of those connectivity points are getting in the way. But of course, it's not just consolidation. It'd be unfair to, to frame it just like that. There is also, there's a lot more work to do. And um, the investment section of the platform website will be published early next year. And what you'll notice there is it's quite a different picture to the set of standards for organizations. It's, it's far more sparse. And so there needs to be more work done and that, that needs to really be driven as well by the market as well as it is by, um, by the standard setters themselves. So again, um, I think I, I think I would just echo the poll results, which is, you know, there's a lot more work to do, but I think the last couple of years has been amazing progress. Thanks so much, Olivia. And thanks for emphasizing this element of, you know, needing partnership, sometimes requiring a bit of sacrifice in terms of your space um, and your platform in order to advance a more common platform that, that does have, have prospects for creating a framework that, that we can all, all gather around. Um, I want to turn to Craig for a final word on, on this panel um, with a bit of reflection on how ADB's engagement with private sector partners and other stakeholders could provide an opportunity to foster the uptake of some of these good practices. I mean, we've been announcing a lot of new work in this space, including our support for energy transition mechanisms and work with other MDBs on just transitions towards decarbonization, but really welcome a few uh, final reflections from, from you as we as you bring this panel to a, to a close. Brilliant. So I love the phrase of, of Fabienne about driving action, and, and we like driving action. I think, you know, in all of our investment documents, we actually include development targets for our, for our clients, um, which can push that, that, that action. But what I want to reflect on, actually, which I think is a great opportunity for all development banks, is the equity space. Um, whether that be where we're directly becoming a, a, an asset owner, owner as, as Shami was saying, or indirectly via private, private equity funds. Those are scenarios where you have influence and you can drive a corporate governance agenda. And as part of that agenda, drive that transparency, drive that reporting, but critically drive the decision making around what you then see and what you need to, to, to do. And, and development banks have been very inconsistent in, in this space. And I don't think anybody's got it quite right or quite put enough resource into that space. And that's something we need to think about because we can appoint nominee directors that can bring press, best practice and help a company. We can also undertake corporate, corporate um, governance assessments. And then that may actually lead to us being able to help clients uh, via you know, grant funding, via technical assistance, you know, something that can actually help them build the data, the systems, the management framework that they need. Because um, we, we touched upon 
meeting these standards is hard, right? It's less hard if you're a listed company uh, in the developing world versus if you're a family uh, owned company in, in the developing world. Um, I have said developed on when I was talking about developed wealth, but it's much, much harder for many of the corporates and many of the financial institutions that we deal with to get their heads around this, but also be able to implement um, the actions that are that are set. And that's a yeah, it's a combination of time, cost and, and effort that can hold this back. So as equity owners, I think we can have a really big um, impact at the micro level. On the macro level, it was really what Olivia was saying, everybody pulling together. Um, we've got to recognize that we've got a very long way to go. It, it's very urgent that we, that we act and that we do the right thing. Um, but we need to help developing member countries. We need to help our clients build the capability, build the sophistication to be able to deliver on this uh, uh, agenda and do it in a in a context sensitive and, and specific way as other other speakers have been referring to. So it's uh, my answer is a combination of the, the the micro level around what a development bank can do directly, but also you know the broader picture. It, it's got to be all about all pulling to to together uh, uh, and helping right across the board. Thanks again to all of our panelists for such a thought provoking set of reflections on a, on a space that, as many others have highlighted, is at a critical juncture. Um, let me now turn to Tomoyuki Kimura, um, who's the Director General of my department, the Strategy Policy and Partnerships Department, um, which is the focal point for this agenda for uh, the Asian Development Bank, for a few closing thoughts. Thanks so much, Tomo. Thanks, Sumita. Good morning or afternoon, everyone. Uh, let, let's start. Uh, by thanking our panelists and uh, VP Valmuiz for their thoughtful remarks. And let me also take a moment to acknowledge VP uh, Valmuiz for her championship of the sustainable uh, development agenda during her tenure as the Asian Development Bank. The SDGs have never been more challenging as the global de development agenda, but they have also never been more relevant. ADB is keenly aware of the urgency of accelerating actions at all levels for the SDGs, as well as the challenges of translating such an encompassing framework into meaningful priorities with our financing operations. Earlier this year, ADB's independent evaluation department undertook its first assessment of ADB's contribution to the SDGs. They concluded that the ADB has been a pioneer amongst development finance institutions in embedding the SDGs in its system to deliver development results. But their review also highlighted the need for us to do more, particularly to help developing member countries mobilize the financing necessary to achieve the SDGs despite the setbacks from COVID-19. The SDG dialogues are a key part of our efforts to deepen our institutional and operational focus on SDG attainment in our region. Revitalize the cooperation with investors in our region will be key to realizing these aspirations, fostering a stronger focus on impact investment that delivers real results in line with the SDGs will be imperative. We are encouraged by the range of initiatives and innovations that this discussion has showcased and the concrete examples of how these are adding value to investors and their businesses. ADB needs to continue to be a leader on this agenda and ensure that our practices are in line with the fast evolving global standards. We are unique in the positions to assist investors in our regions to deepen our, their focus on investments that deliver real impact for the SDGs, while also supporting governments and regulators to make reforms that catalyze and enable SDG-aligned investment. We look forward to greater collaboration with all of you to raise the bar for our own investment and strategies 
while helping our region mobilize the financing necessarily to realize SDGs. Thank you and wish you all the best. Thank you so much, Tomo. And again, a huge thanks to our panelists for their time and insights, um, and to all of you for joining this discussion. We hope you'll join us for the next edition of our SDG Dialogue, which will be in January of next year. Thanks again, and a good day to you all.